it turned out that this was a camp that was formed in our hometown right when they made it uh, maybe a, a week after they made it even right and there were about 25 Jews young people that they left in that camp to do some work and this is how I found myself in the camp that was formed just about two weeks ago they have a name for that camp well, camp Krubyeshev actually it's in our hometown it was a small camp they took six houses in the camp and they allotted to the people maybe eight houses later on because they increased it later when they found in hiding good shoemakers good tailors they they actually brought them into the camp and uh, finally it grew to about 150 people and what kind of work did you do and there? right I, I, I'm getting to that we had two functions people in the camp had two functions number one was to go from house to house and take all because every Jew that remained even if he was still in hiding and those that were sent away to Sabiba uh, left everything behind. They, they just didn't take anything with them. So uh, we were ordered to take and uh, assort all the things that we find in the house as far as clothing is concerned, anything else. Yes. The food we were permitted to bring to our so-called camp and use it for ourselves. Excuse me. Anything else, we were told that they, they designated certain houses as uh, storage places. And we told them that, they told us that we ought to bring it to those places. And from there, they are gradually were shipping them to Germany. And this is how it came about that I, that I found myself in that, among those people. In addition to that function, you asked me what were we doing, there was another function that we had, and that was, of course, the most painful one. As I pointed out, they were still Jews in hiding. As a matter of fact, after they made the city union line, there were close to 3,000 Jews that were hiding. And every day they would go around and find those hiding places with the help of the Polish police or Polish civilians or themselves and then they would take him down to the cemetery first they would take him to prison and from there to the cemetery and shoot him then they would call upon our camp to get a few men with shovels to go down and bury them and this was quite a painful task I mean uh, especially myself uh, I don't remember even seeing a dead person before then when I had to perform that kind of a function. I remember distinctly one incident that will remain with me probably for as long as I live. There was one fellow, actually, you know, there were about eight or nine Gestapo guys that were controlling us, that were in charge of our camp. Of course, they had at their disposal the SS and the Polish police and everybody they wanted to, but there were only about eight or nine to stop a man to whom we were directly responsible. So was one of them was by the name, we called him Alex. And he was an amazing fellow. He spoke Polish fluently. He would go around sometimes and speak Polish, you know, to get people out of a hiding place. You know, they didn't know they were talking to a Gestapo guy, and as soon as they would show their face, he would shoot them. And he also spoke fluently Yiddish. He must have been brought up among Jews because he spoke Yiddish. Many Jews didn't speak as well as he did. And I'm not exaggerating. So one day what happened was he, uh, he came to uh, a street where we were working. I was working. My friend was working there. We were cleaning up the houses there. And he said to the foreman in charge that he needs two fellows. So the foreman, I was working right next to this friend of mine, the foreman assigned the two of us to go with him. So he said to us, I want you to take two shovels and come with me. As soon as he said the word shovels, I, I knew 
the purpose of it. He walked us over to a house, not far, as a matter of fact, from our house, and he uh, kicked, and there was a staircase, a short staircase, you know, leading to the, uh, leading to the door, and it had maybe six steps on each side, and then it had a little cellar underneath those steps. He kicked, there was a door there, he kicked that door and he started screaming, Rouse, Rouse. And out crept out a uh, fellow, maybe maybe 40, maybe not even 40, with a little girl. She must have been seven or eight. They both got out and they looked at us. They didn't know what this was all about. And they looked at him and he said to them, start marching. So they start walking. And after a few minutes, we realized the direction that he was taking us to the uh, cemetery where most of the killing was taking place. And on the way, we were right pa in back of him with the shovels, and we overheard how the uh, man was pleading with him. And he was saying to him, you know, I have a little bit of jewelry for my wife. If you could just let me remain alive, I'm a good worker. I would like to work together with these others. You know, and, he say, and then uh, Alex said to him, what kind of jewelry do you have? So he took out in his pocket, he had a ring, you know, he had a couple of other little things. So he took all of this away from him and didn't say anything. And he kept pleading with him, pleading with him, and, and we kept approaching, you know, the cemetery. Finally, when we got on the cemetery uh, grounds, he told the two of us to stand back. He says, you stay here. And he told them to start marching. And then we noticed maybe 100 feet away or less than that, a whole group of dead people, you know, that were lying there, that were shot before. And he started telling them to march towards that group. And then we watched from the back, took out his pistol and shot them both. And then he turned around and he said to us, I want you to bury all of them and as fast as you can. And then you come back to the camp. And he said, and you take, I want those, the man's boots. All of a sudden he took a liking to the man's boots. So my friend and I started digging that ditch. And as I said, this was my first experience where people that I knew, people that were practically neighbors of ours, that were, he had about a dozen people that were there maybe from the day before, plus these two people. And, we, and he went to the site, lit a cigarette, and we got over there and we started pulling the boot, you know, to get off the boots from him. All of a sudden we hear the man, oi, oi, he wasn't dead. He was badly hurt, injured, and we wouldn't have known what to do with him. But he noticed it, and he says, oh, there will no house stain. The man still wants to get up. And he slowly walked back and took out his gun and he shot him. I'll never forget, uh, it always remained with me right here. He shot him and then he said, Yetzke stood some moisture of Vena. 